Hello, everybody, and welcome to the GMS Magazine YouTube channel and podcast. I am Paco Garcia, your host, and this is the RPG Interview Room, the show in which I am lucky enough to get together with people from the world of role-playing games to discuss, well, role-playing games. As you can tell if you're watching the video, this is not my natural habitat. This is my home. And the reason for that is because we are in confinement because of the coronavirus, and I really hope that you are keeping at home as well and not going out because, well, you know, this is kind of serious, so please do take it seriously. Anyway, um, I have with me Steve Kenson. Steve has been somebody I've looked up to for a very, very long time because he's a very well-known author, uh, but above all, he's also a very militant activist for diversity in role-playing games, and that is something that's very, very dear to my heart. I wanted to talk to him about a topic that whenever it comes out in social media, it really is very controversial and very hot topic. I wanted to talk to him about how to write gay characters within role-playing games. And that is something that an awful lot of people have asked me about. Yes, a lot of people care about it. A lot. So who cares? Yes, a lot of people. Um, and a lot of people ask, well, you know, I want to do it, but I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to put a foot in it. So how do I do it? And I said, well, you know, I think I can give some advice on the matter, but very few people better than Steve to do it. So I wanted to have him on board and see what he had to say. And I think that you're going to enjoy it. So without further ado, please remember to subscribe. Give us a review in iTunes if you're listening to the podcast and give us a thumbs up. And um, take a look at our Patreon. You may find something there that you will like. But and just, you know, have a drink, sit back and enjoy the interview. I think it's going to be very, very good. Uh, Steve, welcome to the show uh, once again after how many years, Steve? Oh, gosh. Um, <sighs> like too I mean, many? Yeah, far too many, I yeah. should say. <laughs> <laughs> I can't recall, so definitely too many. Yeah, no, I, I, we we um, I had to do the show when uh, before the second edition of Blue Rose came oh, out. Oh, okay, that's so, at least a few years. Yeah, yeah, I reckon 2012, 2013, perhaps Thereabouts, something like that. Yeah, so way too long. So anyway, um, today though I have you here because I wanted to talk to you about um, writing LGBTQI characters into gaming fiction whatever mm -hmm. uh because I know a lot of straight people are really worried about doing it making a mistake and getting some some slack um but before we, we go into it um just to kind of warm up a little bit um right uh, and also warning not just to you but the rest of the humanity my cat may make an appearance because he lives here, and that's what he does. Mm -hmm. He may have a question or two as well. Fair enough. Right. Uh, I'm going to ask you five questions um, and, and see what you come up with. All right. Um, tea or coffee? Oh, coffee. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> well, that should be a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, am, a, I am a very well-known uh, coffee aficionado amongst my, fr my friends oh. and family. So. Okay. So now we know what to get you for Christmas. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, the mountain or the beach? Hmm. Um, I don't know. I, I sort of like both equally uh, and for, for different occasions. The beach is certainly more relaxing than the mountains, but I do like hiking a mountain. Okay. Uh, cars or motorbikes? Oh, cars. I don't think that uh, uh, motorcycles and I would, would do well together. Uh, <laughs> As far as that goes. Okay, fair enough. Okay, this one gets a little bit harder. Fantasy or science fiction? Ooh, that is harder. Um, yeah, again, that's I like I like them both equally well for different reasons. Um, so I, yeah, that's hard to say. I, okay. I don't know if I could pick. Okay, both. Good, good. And last question. Uh, also. 
Some people find this one light heart. Some people find this one very easy. Um, mm. Zombies or vampires? Oh, vampires. Okay. <laughs> vampires. Vampires. I mean, if, if I have to choose between them, I mean, vampires are much more are are much sexier and more hygienic than zombies. Um, True. They have a lot more uses as well. Right. right. <laughs> you know, they're more versatile. Okay, good. All right. So now that we know that you can answer questions and uh, you can answer them truthfully, um, let's let's start with um, with a topic that brings us together. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there, I think it's safe to say that the world of role playing games is experiencing a widening of their perspective of both characters and genres and NPCs, mm -hmm. type of adventures that we are seeing, and that is indeed creating a reaction from an awful lot of people who still feel uncomfortable about the mere existence of people like you and I. Mm -hmm. um, but also a lot of people who are coming to the realization that, you know what, yeah, this should be part of it. Uh, this could add some richness to what I'm writing, and they're very worried about doing it. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, as a gay person, how how could people start when they want to include LGBT into their writing? What is a good starting point? Well, I think that, uh, you know, a good starting point is, is simply giving some thought to our default assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as far as that goes, uh, I don't know if it's uh, apocryphal or not, but uh, supposedly um, Chris Claremont, the writer of the X-Men, had a, a sign, you know, by his desk that basically said, why can't it be a woman? Okay. Um, I didn't you know, know. That's amazing. To, to occasionally remind him when he was coming up with characters, you know, of, you know, why does it have to be the male default? And, you know, similarly, I think that when we're creating characters for our stories, you know, whether they are, you know, key characters or they're simply background characters, you know, taking, just taking a moment to ask ourselves, you know, why, you know, what are our, what are my default assumptions about this character and why am I assuming those things? Um, you know, why, why does the innkeeper have to be a man? Why does the innkeeper's partner have to be a woman? Why, you know, uh, you know, any of those sorts of things, you know, any of the numerous characters that you're going to include uh, in your, your stories, as far as that goes. Um, and I think that that's a reasonable place to start as far as that goes, is just is just questioning our own assumptions. And I think that's important for all creators uh, because we all have our own sort of default uh, assumptions, you know, from our culture, from our background, from our own experience, uh, as far as that goes. And as well from just the, the other media that we consume that, you know, provides us with the examples that we're, we're working from. Now, but that will echo a question that is also way too often heard in in the RPG circles is that why make them gay? What would be the point? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, why make them straight? What's the point of that? Uh, you know, why make a character anything? You know, as far as that goes, the the notion that the characters have any kind of personal traits, whether it be their their heritage or their their gender or their ethnicity or their mm -hmm sexuality or any of those various things are just to give those characters verisimilitude, to give them depth and to give them the appearance that they're real people mm -hmm. in this story. So, you know, making a character, uh, determining if the character is, is queer or if the character is of a particular gender or anything about them is simply, you know, adding a facet to who they are uh, in the context of that story. Um, you know, it's, it's, a common, it's a common notion that inclusion needs some kind of justification yes. uh, as far as that goes of, you know, well, if this character is gay or if this character is a woman or if this character is black, 
what plot purpose does that serve? Um, as if, you know, as if, you know, they're, as if those qualities of a person need to have some kind of justification. Mm -hmm. uh, when in fact they're just who people are uh, and if they don't need any more justification in the terms of the plot than a character's maleness or whiteness or straightness or any of their other qualities that we just take for granted because they're the most common kinds of characters we see. In terms of deciding, you know, um, you're asking people why do they need to be a woman why why can't they be you know uh, gay characters um one of the things though that people have to face um, and you were very much uh, hitting the nail on the head with that is their very own preconceptions of what being gay or lesbian mm -hmm. or trans actually is sure and i can imagine obviously i, I don't know this because i'm not straight so i i have no idea what it must be like to face the discomfort of challenging one's preconceptions of what homosexuality is because mm -hmm. it's been ingrained how can people go about that i mean what would be the tools that straight people could use to face that discomfort about discovering that there is no particular reason for us to exist we, we just do um, well, I, you know, I guess I would start with, you know, widen your circle of friends. Um, if, <laughs> you know, if you, if you don't know any, you know, uh, any LGBTQ people, uh, you know, in your life, you know, try and, you know, w w meet more people, but <laughs> get out more. I, but speaking as a, you know, as a, as a writer who works at home, I understand that widening your social circle is, is not always easy. Um, you know, I have plenty of times where I have to ask myself whether I've left the house on any given day. Um, you know, but some of it is also the 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 media that we consume. Uh, you know, look for um, look for media that is representative. Uh, look for um, the read the stories of of queer people. Uh, there are plenty of biographies. There are plenty of you know stories about what it's like to grow up uh, gay or bisexual or transgender. Um, there are plenty of stories about what coming out is like. There are plenty of stories about what dating is like. Uh, you, know, um, you know, read more uh, you know, about people who are not like you um, and find out what their, what their lives are like uh, as far as that goes. And, you know, I mean, that touches upon uh, another thing in terms of doing your your research is that while it's important for us to to question our assumptions and to look for opportunities to to include diverse characters in a variety of roles it's also important to not assume that those characteristics make those characters interchangeable uh, in a lot of ways you know it's also going a step further than that uh, the next step beyond inclusion is is saying how does how do these qualities of the character inform who they are in this setting? Because if the police detective that the characters encounter is a woman, you know she's not a, a, an absolute equivalent to a male character in that instance. She has no doubt had very different experiences as uh, you know, a professional police officer who's a woman. If she's a police officer who's also a lesbian, then she's probably had different experiences, you know, both in her, her earlier life and in her professional career. And you know, that should reflect you know, in terms of who the character is. Um, and obviously how much, of, how much depth you get into depends on how important the character is to the plot overall and you know whether or not this is just a a background character uh but it's it's important to to look at uh, how characters identities inform who they are As, let's assume that i i want to write a gay character into my game and Let's face it, there's an awful lot of people in, in rural areas that have it very difficult to access real life 
in information. What would be the first thing that you would say if, if you're going to do this, avoid this? What, what would this be? I think that it would be drawing a huge arrow towards the fact that the character is gay. Okay. Um, I don't think, unless, again, unless it's especially germane, um, and this is the area where you do get, you get talk about the relevancy of, of the plot, mm -hmm. um, unless their identity is, is, is hugely, you know, a key thing, um, I don't think it needs highlighting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that it, it, like any other characteristic, when you're describing this character, you know, it should be treated like any other thing. Uh, that you are describing, it doesn't need to be, uh, you know, written in in great, you know, big letters to draw attention to it. At the same time, you don't have to be coy and, uh, you know, try and find clever ways to imply it without just outright saying so. Okay. Um, you know, as far as that goes. Um, so, you know, I think I think it's it's sometimes, and especially if. If it's somebody who feels that this is a, a huge thing, um, sometimes there's a, a tendency to treat it, treat it as bigger than it is in the in the context um, that it's appearing. Uh, would you say that how how to phrase what I'm what I'm trying to figure out? Um, would you say that trying to tick a box mm -hmm. in terms of describing the character and um, just mentioning the fact that they are not straight because we tend to assume heteronormativity you know mm -hmm. if we don't say that this character has a husband instead of a wife we're going to assume that their relationships are going to be heterosexual mm -hmm. um, that, that's just how we are geared as, sure. as human beings so how how important is it to actually tick the box to make sure that you know uh, we don't get a dumbledore effect basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's important to say it, you know, I mean, I think that, it, you know, you do run into that, you know, sort of uh, default assumption uh, quality, you know, there's, there's this, you know, sort of, of Schrodinger's cat effect, you know, that if, if something isn't stated, people just sort of fill in details with their own assumptions. Um, so it's, if, if a character has you know, a quality that you want, you know, you want to make sure people know they have, then make sure they know they have it. Um, I don't think it has to be any more complicated than simply saying it. Um, I did uh, an adventure recently um, for uh, for Torg, um, and uh, the um, main um, non-player character uh, that the the characters interact with in the adventure is a trans woman. Um, and, uh, I simply say when I'm describing her that she's a trans woman, uh, and that's, that's all there is to it, uh, as far as that goes. And I'm sure that some of that, uh, informs the fact that she's also uh, a rebel and an underground fighter and a member of the resistance, uh, in, uh, the cyber papacy, which is where the adventure takes place. But I don't dwell on all of that uh it's you know because it's a short a very short adventure that's basically just a couple of scenes um but i wanted to make it clear that the woman that the characters meet is a trans woman uh, and not a cisgendered woman uh so it was just important to point it out as far as that goes uh, whether the characters ever even find out in the adventure is entirely up to how the game master runs it um because they may not know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but it's important to me. It was important to me that the game master know it okay. uh, and, and be able to run that adventure accordingly. Uh, do you think that that will influence uh, in some way the, the way that people run the, the people up, um, that, that adventure? Because uh, whether we like it or not, that is something that people could use Mm -hmm. uh, in game, somehow. Um, you sure. Know. Sure. I I I like to hope that it will influence how the adventure is run, uh, and that it will at least cause 
the the game master to to consider some things about this character mm -hmm. uh you know as far as what that means um obviously you know i can't control that you know as with anything we put out there you know in game content mm -hmm. but um i think that it's i think it introduces an opportunity that would not necessarily have otherwise been there um and it, it provides a chance to say to the game master hey here's this idea well, also i think it provides a grounds for how the world is run you know i remember mm -hmm. um a few years ago we were playing seventh scene and uh, we were in i don't remember what city and there was a cardinal of this uh, the religion mm -hmm. you know the christian like kind of religion in there yep. and i had no idea what the world was like it was the first time i was playing sensi mm -hmm. and and i said to the guy um well because i'm a woman you know i was playing a female character i said well i'm, I'm going to try to flirt with him mm -hmm. and and the gm said well okay you you try but he's married to another man so you know mm -hmm. he's his husband and the thing is immediately that said to me oh okay so this is not a homophobic world mm -hmm. right away and suddenly the whole perception of these sort of renaissance middle ages kind of world disappeared yeah. Yeah. completely just by saying this guy's married to another man it's quite a shift right mm -hmm. away it's, it has absolutely quite an impact in how it plays absolutely so so um considering that how do you think it's a good way to to tell people you know let's bring this into this universe even if it feels because that's something that especially with the trans community there's been an awful lot of background backlash when when people mm -hmm. have tried to add trans characters how is a good way to say no you know don't overthink it just mm -hmm. accept it i think that depends very heavily on the game's context um you know uh, because because queer content and queer characters exist in relationship to a culture and to a, a setting as far as that goes um, how they're included depends very heavily on the the context um, you know torg for example you know it exists in a a very alternate earth uh, but you know it's it's essential foundation is an earth much like ours um, so you know we can draw upon we have the advantage of shorthanding all of the elements of our culture you know in that setting um, and we can just take for granted a lot of the things that we already know in the same way that a uh, like a modern day action adventure game or a modern day comic book superhero game can can simply say well it's basically like our world but Mm -hmm. um and and you know we can shorthand all of the things that everybody already knows we don't have to explain what airplanes are uh as far as that goes for example um and likewise we don't have to explain our own history and culture necessarily um in a more either historical or fantasy context um uh, it starts to get into well what is the culture of that world like and how does that culture see things like gender and sexuality uh and that's where you're you you face the challenge as a creator of of both building something that's relatable um and that is is you know, not too difficult to not too alien uh, as far as that goes um but also at the same time providing enough information so that players uh know what what the what the world is like um you know talking about 7th c as an example you know 7th c relies on a lot of um sort of stereotypes about renaissance history um you know 7th c takes basically you know, sort of cherry picks elements of european history mm -hmm. for uh, over a span of hundreds of years uh and says let's put all of let's put all of the interesting bits together at the same time 
you know, in spite of the fact that they they are no way historically adjacent. No, of course, here until no. <laughs> um, you know, and you know, and then you know goes you know a step further and messes with things like saying, well, there is you know no there's no homophobia in the mm -hmm. setting, you know, which is curious because there are still fairly traditional gender roles mm -hmm. in the setting. Uh, and there's not a lot of discussion about how those two things interact mm -hmm. as far as that goes. Um, you know, I mean, women still wear, you know, elaborate gowns. Uh, and, uh, you know, the um, courtesan class, you know, is largely female. <laughs> yes. You know, but at the same time, there's there's still this sort of gender parity, you know, um, but there's also noble families with primogeniture and presumably, you know, arranged political marriages and, you know, a whole system of inheritance that's based on heteronormativity, at least we assume. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it starts to get a very tangled web when you start pulling at those threads, uh, you know, in terms of uh, inclusion, especially when it comes to issues of gender and orientation. Um, and you have to really think about that in the larger context uh, of the setting. And also because it's very easy, even without realizing when you're trying to do those things, uh, to actually punch down, which mm -hmm. is a mistake that an awful lot of time happens when, when people, straight people write LGBT characters or even LGBT issues. You know, we, we have the, the fairly recent example of White Wolf with the Chechnya massacre and, and how mm -hmm. I know that they wanted to just bring the awareness and this, but it was just a really, really badly judged mm -hmm. uh, punch down. So how can that be avoided? What, what are the signs that can tell this is not going in the direction it should? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of it is, you know, about um, in, inclusion, taking inclusion to also be a, a measure of empowerment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's, there, there's especially a tendency uh, in um, queer inclusion towards uh, what a lot of people refer to as tragedy porn. Um, you know, uh, of the notion that the, the focus on queer characters is entirely about how their lives are such a terrible struggle, uh, that they face all of these uh, uh, terrible prejudices, that they've suffered tremendous abuse, uh, and you know, just on and on basically about how, how terrible their lives are. Um, and while that's an while that's an aspect of the queer struggle that we don't want to necessarily plaster over, uh, at the same time, it's important to show queer characters as people, first and foremost, who have good and bad parts of their, their lives. Um, and if you're going to include those kinds of, those elements of, of struggle, of showing characters who have successfully come through that or have overcome that or have moved past that uh, in some way um, to, to simply portray queer characters as nothing but victims mm -hmm. um, is, you know, isn't inclusion in the, in the sense of empowerment. It's inclusion in the sense that it says, you know, and you have to think about it from the perspective of a of a queer reader. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it says yes, you exist in this world, but your life is awful, and it will never get better. Uh, you know, and that's not a message I think no. that you really want to send. No, actually, you know, I, I remember having a conversation with a historian um, who wrote a game called Aquelarre, which has been published in in English not long ago, mm -hmm. and it's meant to be a very historically accurate. Um, setting uh, based in, in medieval Spain and I, I had an argument with him on, on Facebook because he went on to say well if you want to play a gay character in Aquelarre then your mm -hmm. life is going to be a misery and and I kind of shut him up 
or when I said to him, you know, uh, gay people, lesbian people, trans people, queer people existed in those mm -hmm. times and their lives also, yeah, they might have been awful, but they survived. So why don't you concentrate on the fact that they went through, that they survived, that they developed this mm -hmm. resilience, this strength to go on and on and on, rather than concentrating on the fact that they were just being beaten constantly by everything around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that was a bit of a realization for him that, you know, probably had, yeah, these people survived. Mm -hmm. they, they just, they didn't just suffer. They, mm -hmm. they survived. Right, right. And um, historical yeah, right. accuracy is also often not. Oh, uh, I, I could. Uh, we could make a whole podcast just on on that because the, right. this notion that people have of kings and queens living in castles and everything being so peasantly and it's like, oh, quit the bullshit. Okay, yeah. <laughs> your yeah. high school history is not history. They're stories. It's oh, <laughs> it's horrific. Absolutely yeah. horrific. Okay. Um, let, let's um, let's start winding down because we've been going at it for a while and I, I can imagine people are going to have an awful lot of information to, to digest and, and think mm. about. But let, let's go into a top three tips on how to go about either writing characters, uh, gay characters, or mistakes to avoid mm -hmm. when, when writing characters. What would be the number three thing to either do or not do? Well... Uh... I think the, the major important things uh, to take into account um, when you're looking to include uh, queer characters in your work, um, first and foremost, is simply um, questioning your assumptions. You know, it's, it's, you know, first and foremost is include them, um, you know, uh, actually do it. Um, you know, inclusion that you just think about doing doesn't get, you know, anybody any benefits. Um, so it is as scary as it can be sometimes, I really encourage authors to expand their horizons and challenge their assumptions and just go ahead and include some diverse characters uh, in their work. Um, uh, second is uh, do, do some research, um, talk to queer people, you know, uh, the first and foremost, um, but also, you know, read our, read our stories, uh, read our work, read our history, uh, find out, you know, what it, what life is like for us, you know, what, you know, uh, queer perspectives sound like, um, what, uh, you know, consume media that does a good job of portraying queer characters. Um, and uh, if you have the means uh, I, I encourage, you know, creators, if uh, they run, if they have questions, if they have challenges to, to work with a sensitivity reader, um, to take a look at their work and say, hey, I wrote this scene or this bit or this thing that involves a queer character. Would you take a look at it and tell me what you think of it? Um, and, you know, listen honestly to the feedback uh, that you get about that, um, and especially if you are a professional um, writer, designer, creator, publisher, be prepared to pay people for their time um, if you're going to ask them to, you know, spend it professionally evaluating your work. Um, you know, I mean, by all means, ask your friends, but you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna work with a sensitivity reader or any professional, be prepared to pay them. Yeah, that's definitely good advice, and it doesn't happen often enough. Right, last thing is something I wanted to ask you before, and I just completely forgot. Um, it's, it's a scenario that um, somebody asked me, because they, they really mm -hmm. said, well, how? Um, let's imagine that somebody writes some, some character, and they make some mistakes, and they do get some very harsh criticism. And, and we know that people can get really, especially on social networks, Mm -hmm. It can be an absolute barrage of very, very harsh criticism, sometimes more just than others. Yeah. What would be the right response to that? How can people cope and deal with that kind of reaction to get out of it as unscathed as possible? Mm -hmm. A lot of it is 
a willingness to listen to criticism. Um, and I think that that can be very challenging, uh, especially in um, niche hobby fields or niche fields of publishing or ones that have very actively engaged fan bases um, because uh, there, there really is a very distinct difference between criticism and uh, somebody who just vocally doesn't like something, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I understand that a lot of people can be very harsh um, and often, frankly, step over a line when it comes to offering, you know, criticism. Um, but I think that it's important as a creative uh, to listen to valid criticism of your work um, and to be willing to hear uh, feedback, especially if it's from uh, someone who is part of a, a marginalized group uh, and they have, they have a critique about how you have portrayed their identity in your work. I think it's important to say, okay, I would like to hear what you have to say. Um, and, um, you know, really, uh, it, you know, as challenging, as difficult as that is, um, it's important to say, I will hear what you have to say. I would, I welcome your feedback and to basically follow the maxim of, you know, I did the very best that I could when I did this and I'm going to learn to do better the next time I do it. And I hopefully I'm going to keep learning to do better each time I do it um, and uh, that things can improve. You know, I, my own example um, was that when I did the uh, development on the first edition of Blue Rose, uh, we included an element in there uh, that was, uh, that could be read as very anti-trans um, and uh, that uh, basically suggested that the, the notion of um, uh, using uh, arcana to, to transform the, the, the natural state of the body in some way was in some fashion unnatural or corrupt. Um, and it was primarily intended as a, as a game balance mm -hmm. notion. Um, but in the context of what was what was meant to be a very queer friendly setting, um, a number of trans readers found that to be very anti-trans, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and I heard about it, um, and uh, I you know considered it from the the feedback that we got, and they they were absolutely correct, uh, and it was simply a, a perspective that I as a as a cis man didn't have. Um, and so when it came around to uh, doing the second edition of uh, Blue Rose, I made sure to hire a trans author um, to write about trans characters and their experience in the setting um, so that we would have a, a, the proper perspective on it uh, as far as that went. Uh, and that's just, you know, that's one of those, those instances, although it was unintended, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was, it was a bad take and it, it needed to be improved. Uh, and that happens. And it can happen, I think, to anyone. I think one thing that's pretty important is when, when you get in the criticism is look beyond the tone, mm -hmm. look at the message, not, don't, don't keep just the tone, because the tone can be off-putting, but what the person sure. is saying is what truly matters, and that's, that's sure. really, really important. Right, okay, we've been at it for 36 minutes now, so <laughs> we, can, we can wind down now, and uh, hopefully uh, we, can, we can get back to this topic at some point, because I bet that this is going to have uh, an awful lot of feedback and comments mm. from an awful lot of people. But um, before you go, I have um, three more questions for you. Um, First question is, what's, what's the best advice that no one has ever given you? That no one has ever given me? Yeah. Um, gosh. Um, best advice no one's ever given me? Hmm. Um, 
Well, that's tough. <laughs> um, I guess that I uh, wish that um, I had been advised to uh, be uh, more proactive in in sort of promoting my own uh, work uh, back in the day. Um, I, I, I'm still to this day not very good at, at self-promotion. Um, and it's, it's a challenge when you're, uh, when you're a creative and when you're a, especially when you're a freelancer, um, you know, you, you have to, to be able to sell yourself, uh, to, uh, to a certain degree. Um, and, uh, it's one of those things that I, I wish someone had, uh, advised me on, on how to be better at. Um, when I was I was getting when I was starting out. Okay, that's a very good advice to give to yourself. Well done. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, second question: um, What's the best mistake that you would like to make again? Oh, the best mistake I'd like to make again. Um, hmm. I guess if. I was thinking about it as a mistake, um, just, um, you know, the, I guess the, ultimately the, the best mistake I'd still make again was, um, quitting my corporate day job to, to work uh, in the game industry. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my, my timing on it was, was not very good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and it, it resulted in a, a, very difficult year that followed. Um, you know, I basically did the, you know, they say don't quit your day job and I did. Um, but at the same time, I have to say that, you know, if, if I had it to do it over again, I'd still do it because I think, I'm not sure there is a really good time um, to, to make that transition. Uh, so, um, you know, ultimately I'm glad I did it and I would gladly do it again. Okay, good. Um, last question. Um, imagine that you have a time machine and, um, you know, you go back in time, what else you do, and you meet your 10 year old self and you tell, you tell your 10 year old self, do not do this. What is this? Uh, don't wait so long to come out. Okay. Um, if I could, I, I, oh my gosh, if I could talk to my 10 year old self, um, the things I would have to tell him, um, <laughs> You know, because it's such a, you know, it's such a difference. You know, I mean, I knew I was, I knew I was queer a lot, even before I was 10. Um, but I definitely knew by the time I was 10. Um, and um, I would definitely tell my, try and explain to my, as best I could to my 10 year old self that it was going to be okay. Um, that, you know, that, that you, you won't have to wait, you don't have to wait as long as you think you do. Um, even, you know, even back then, you know, uh, you know, and again, it's one of those things that everybody comes out in their own time and when they're ready and there's no knowing when that's going to be. But at the same time, I, I would have tried to explain to, to 10 year old me uh, who didn't think there was, you know, much of a future, you know, uh, just what that future was like, because I couldn't even have imagined it then. That's an awesome story. Steve, thank you. My so, pleasure. So much. I uh, hope we can do this again. Hopefully, it won't be another seven years. Uh, we, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, we'll do it. We'll do it again very, very often because um, I'm sure that you're going to be producing some absolutely fantastic stuff in the very near future. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And we haven't spoken to you as, a, as an author and what you're doing because it wasn't what this podcast was all about. But we will do it in the next one for sure. And hopefully, Sounds it will good. be very soon. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it. I think it's quite important, you know, the main point that Steve made about asking LGBT people, don't just go out there on a limb and do it, just ask around, get a sensitivity editor, because I think you have an awful lot to gain from trying. You have absolutely 
nothing to lose, absolutely nothing to lose by having a go at it and by taking some very few steps. You can make sure that, uh, you know, everybody is going to be happier with your work and hopefully your work also be better for it. So I hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, please do leave me your comments. It would be great to hear what you have to say. And I genuinely look forward to hearing what, what you have to say and talking to you. Um, once again, please do remember to subscribe to the channel. It means an awful lot as it does every single like that we get. Uh, leave us a review in iTunes if you're listening to the podcast. And uh, please do chip in in our Patreon and give us a hand. But until the next time, thank you once again for being there and I will talk to you very, very soon. Take care.